Section 7.3 Integration with Partial Fractions So in this section we're looking at a general method that helps us to integrate rational functions. So let's say functions that look like p of x over q of x. That would of course be where p of x and q of x are polynomials. Uh, let's look at an example to get us going and, and thinking about the idea here. So suppose I had a simple rational function with, let's say, a constant numerator of 3 and a quadratic denominator of x squared minus x minus 20. Okay, notice, of course, that that denominator factors into two linear factors, x minus 5 and x plus 4. And it might be natural to ask, is it possible to decompose that fraction into two lesser fractions? And by lesser, I mean they don't have denominators that contain x minus 5 and x plus 4. And of course, what are the natural denominators I might think about over here? Well, it's those two linear factors, x minus 5 and x plus 4. And the question is, if this is possible to decompose this into two fractions with those two denominators, what would those two numerators look like? And of course, this would be similar if we just think about a simpler case with numbers. We're saying, would it be possible to take something like 7 over 20 and express that as the sum of two partial fractions, partial in the sense that one of them is made out of one factor of 20 and the other would be made out of the other factor of 20. Now of course in this case if we just made those two unknown numerators let's say constants a and b then of course we know that 7 over 20 would have to equal 4a plus 5b over 20 and that of course would tell us that a and b would have to obey this equation. And for any suitable choices of A and B that would make this equation true, we would have a so-called partial fraction decomposition of the fraction 7 over 20, built out of individual fractions added together with those denominators which are factors of 20. Okay, that's precisely what we're talking about doing up here, except we're dealing with polynomials instead of constants. So again, the question down here would be, is it possible to write 3 over x minus 5 times x plus 4 as something over x minus 5 plus something over x plus 4? Okay. Let's think simply. When we looked at this example with 7 over 20, our obvious choice was to create two constants for those unknown numerators. Let's try that down here. And let's say or ask, is it possible to create two partial fractions with constant numerators so that the sum of those two partial fractions gets me my 3 over x squared minus x minus 20. Okay, if that's the case, then of course I have 3 over x minus 5 times x plus 4 equals a times x plus 4 plus b times x minus 5 over x minus 5 times x plus 4. Now, Notice that this equation is valid for all values of x in the domains of the expressions on each side of the equation, i.e. x not equal to 5 and x not equal to negative 4. And in particular, if I expand the numerator on the left side, 
it looks like I have AX plus 4A plus BX minus 5B. Now, notice what this equation is, is asking for, or what we're seeking. I don't want an equation that's solvable for x, as in I'm looking for a particular solution for x to this equation. I want this equation to be true for all real values of x. And the only way these two fractions are going to be equal to each other for all valid values of x, not equal to 5 and not equal to negative 4, is if these two numerators are equal. Okay, the way we usually write that in mathematics, we would write 3 and we would write ax plus 4a plus bx minus 5b. And rather than write an equal sign, we're going to write a, it looks like a triple equal sign. And when we write that triple equal sign, that's a symbol for identically equal. And we are really calling this now an identity. And if you think about what that meant in trigonometry, an identity was which is identity was an equation that was true for all valid values of x. That is, it wasn't an equation for which you were seeking a particular solution for x. When I write 3x plus 2 equals let's say 8, the solution to that equation is a particular value of x. So of course I get 3x equals 6 and I get x equals 2. So there is one solution. When I write something like sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1, I know that for all valid values of x, this equation is true, not just for one value of x or two values of x, but for infinitely many. Okay, in the case of this equation that we've made by equating these two numerators, I want this to be an identity because I want it to be true for all x, not just a particular solution or a few particular solutions. All right, that's key because if you notice what that says, if I write the right side of that equation as a plus b times x, and you can see there that I'm grouping the two x terms, plus 4a minus 5b. All right, now notice the expression on the right side of the equation is a polynomial. a plus b is the first degree coefficient, 4a minus 5b is the constant term. If this equation is going to be true for all values of x, that is infinitely many values of x. Well, there's only one way that can work. And I'll just remind you, um, if my equation is this, and you're telling me that this expression on the right side of the equation is a first degree polynomial, you know from algebra that a first degree polynomial can only have one zero. Well, right now, this equation says that that first-degree polynomial has infinitely many zeros since it's an identity. The only way that's possible is if this coefficient is zero. Okay, now here's the simple way to think about this. If I go back to this line and I view both sides of that equation as a polynomial, then you can see the first-degree coefficient is a plus b. The constant term is 4a minus 5b. On the left side of the equation, what's the first degree coefficient? Well, it's 0 because there is no first degree term. What's the constant term? Well, it's 3. Okay, putting that all together, the only way this identity can be true for all values of x is if the coefficients on each side of the equation match. That is, the first degree coefficient on the left side of the equation, or right side of the equation, has to match 
the first degree coefficient on the left side of the equation. The constant term or constant coefficient on the right side of the equation has to match exactly the constant term on the left side of the equation. Okay, that means in this case I get a system of equations. Um, solvable in many ways. Let's say we multiply the top equation by 5 so that we get 5a plus 5b equals 0. When I put that together with 4a minus 5b equals 3, adding both equations gives me 9a equals 3, which means a equals 1 third. When I go back to the first equation that says a plus b equals 0, that of course is the same thing as saying that b equals negative a, but we just said that a is one third. That means b equals negative one third. Okay, so let's summarize here. We've taken the fraction 3 over x minus 5 times x plus 4. We've asked, is it possible to decompose that into two fractions? one made out of the one linear factor in the denominator that we started with and another made out of the other factor. We created generic unknown constant numerators and when we created those we came up with a equals one-third and b equals negative one-third. Okay that means this fraction is expandable in the form one-third over x minus 5 plus negative one-third over x plus 4. All right, before we go any further, let's get right to the crux of why we're doing this. The real question is, how do I integrate something like 3 over x minus 5 times x plus 4? Which, of course, remember, that was originally integral 3 over x squared minus x minus 20. Um, I'll let you check. Uh, well, actually, we'll go ahead and do it. What's the only other time we've seen an integral like this so far in this class that we've had some technique for handling? Well, if it's possible to complete that square, then if I could make that denominator look like a u squared plus an a squared, this would lead to a tan inverse antiderivative. Uh, notice if you complete the square on this one, um, half of negative 1 is negative 1 half. If I square negative 1 half, that gives me 1 quarter. If I also subtract 1 quarter, that would give me minus 20 and 1 quarter when I add it to the minus 20. So this integral becomes 3 over x minus 1 half squared minus 20 and a quarter. And notice that has the form 3 over u squared minus a constant. And that's not a form that we have a method to address yet. If this were a plus, this would be a tan inverse case. That doesn't apply here. All right, but we figured out with a little bit of algebra that we can express this as the integral of 1 third over x minus 5 minus 1 third over x plus 4. And we recognize that those are easy log integrations. This is 1 third ln absolute value of x minus 5 minus 1 third ln absolute value x plus 4. Um, it's okay to leave the answer in that form, although we realize we could also write this as 1 third ln x minus 5 over x plus 4 by using some of our log properties. Okay, so this is our first example of partial fraction decomposition, and we'll do several more, but before we do, let's go back to this problem for a moment.
So when we created these mystery partial fractions, that is something over x minus 5 and something over x plus 4, we started by trying just constant numerators. Uh, inevitably, the question you should be asking at some point is, why didn't we make those numerators something larger? Um, if we're dealing with linear functions or linear factors in that denominator, um, why wouldn't we consider the possibility that that numerator be a linear function instead of just a constant? So the question is, what would happen if I did that? And we want to look at what happens if we try to do this to get a general sense of how this method of partial fraction decomposition really works. So quickly let's look at what happened, what would happen if I did make those numerators linear functions. Now obviously I could multiply ax plus b times x plus 4 and cx plus d times x minus 5. That would get me my common numerator for this combined fraction. Uh, you should notice that if I did that I would get x terms and quadratic terms. Let me write that. We would have ax plus b times x plus 4 plus cx plus d times x minus 5 over x minus 5 times x plus 4. Now I'm not going to expand everything out, but obviously we can see here that we would get x squared terms here and here. There would also be x terms. And we already suspect that possibly then this is too much because I'm producing quadratic terms and x terms when there aren't any in this numerator that we started with. Okay, let's look at it a slightly different way. If I wrote that first fraction as a times x minus 5 plus 5a plus b, and you'll notice there that I've just done the little trick of adding 0. There's a minus 5a and a plus 5a, and when I cancel those out, I still have ax plus b. But of course, what I've done there is expressed the part that has the a in front of it as a function of x minus 5, which is that factor in that denominator. Let me do the same thing for the other one. That is, if this part is this fraction, then I could do something similar with this one. I could call it c times x plus 4 minus 4c plus d over x plus 4. Notice that if I clean things up a little bit, I definitely have a times x minus 5 over x minus 5 plus 5a plus b over x minus 5 plus c times x plus 4 over x plus 4 plus minus 4c plus d over x plus 4. And obviously, as long as x is not 5, and x is not negative 4, it's clear that these two terms reduce to constants, which means the partial fraction decomposition I've come up with here contains two constant terms and two partial fraction terms, one for each of the denominators x minus 5 and x plus 4, but look how complicated those numerators are. They involve the constant a and some other constant, and this one down at the end involves the constant c and some other constant. There are four constants involved in this expansion now. When we did this the other way, we only had two. Instead of having just two essential terms, as when we did it before, now we really have four different terms two of which are constant terms. And if we follow this through, it will work. But this should be enough to convince you that this is overkill. I've produced something that's a much larger expansion than necessary. 
And that's really because I created numerators in which the degrees were larger than they needed to be. All right, so that leads us to the general idea, which is the following. If we have a linear factor of x minus a in our rational function, then let's say our partial fraction decomposition will or should contain a fraction of the form a over x minus a. That's where a is a constant. And so what we're saying is when we create those individual fractions in that partial fraction decomposition, the unknown numerator is going to be a constant, degree 0. Okay, let's look at a, a related question to this. So let's say we have the fraction x cubed plus x minus 7 over x squared plus 7x plus 12. Now, of course, you should spot right away that if I try to build a partial fraction decomposition, with fractions that look like some unknown over x plus 3 and some other unknown over x plus 4, that when I try to put those together, you notice that I'm not going to have enough material in the numerator to actually reach something in the numerator that's third degree. Actually, the most I have here is degree 1 with the ax term and the bx term. Okay, that means maybe I have to back up on what I said a minute ago, and maybe these numerators need to be larger degree to match this. Now, there is a logic behind that and a way to approach it that would involve making these numerators a little bit bigger. The problem is how much bigger. Uh, the, if you take that approach, which is seldom done in any of these books, then you would need to adjust uh, the forms of these numerators to match the degree of this numerator that you're trying to target. All right, that's doable, but there's a much simpler way, and this is the way we're going to do it. This is the standard. The reason this is happening is because the degree of the numerator is larger than the degree of the denominator. And in fact, you've known for a long time that any time you have a partial fra or a fraction, a rational function, in which the numerator has a degree that's greater than or equal to the denominator, uh, for most applications, we normally want to do a long division. Notice that if we do that here, that is, we divide x squared plus 7x plus 12 into x cubed plus 0x squared plus x minus 7. Let's see, that's going to go x. x times x squared gives me x cubed. x times 7x gives me 7x squared. x times 12 gives me 12x. If I subtract, I'm going to get minus 7x squared minus 12x minus 7. Uh, x squared goes into minus 7x squared minus 7 times. Minus 7 times x squared is minus 7x squared. Minus 7 times 7x is minus 49x. Minus 7 times 12 is minus 84. If I subtract, I'm going to get a remainder of looks like 37x. Oh, I spotted an error. I think on this line above here, uh, x 
minus 12x should be minus 11x. Let's uh, correct that. So let's double check my work there. 0x squared minus 7x squared, 7x squared. And now I'm looking at x minus 12x is minus 11x. Uh, x squared goes into minus 7x squared minus 7. So minus 7 times x squared gives me minus 7x squared. Minus 7 times 7x minus 49x. Minus 7 times 12 minus 84. I think we're in good shape now. Uh, what does that change down here? I think it's going to change that x term. Now it's minus 11x plus 49x, which would be 38x. And then I have minus 7 plus 84, which should be plus 77. Okay, what does this tell me? It tells me that x cubed plus x minus 7 over x squared plus 7x plus 12 is equal to x minus 7, that's the quotient, plus the remainder, which is 38x plus 77, over the denominator or the divisor, x squared plus 7x plus 12. And if you think back to uh, long division and, and what you remember about long division, if the degree of this numerator is greater than or equal to the degree of this denominator, then when I do long division, I'm going to end up here at the end with this fraction, which is the remainder over the divisor. And if I've done everything properly, that fraction will definitely have a numerator whose degree is less than, strictly less than, the degree of the denominator, which means this fraction that we've written here at the end is definitely something that I can do a partial fraction decomposition on in the way that I showed you in the last example, which is as long as the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator and the denominator is factorable into linear factors, then my partial fraction decomposition should just be a sum of partial fractions with constant numerators, one for each of the linear factors that make up that denominator. In other words, when I go to integrate x cubed plus x minus 7 over x squared plus 7x plus 12, we're really going to be integrating x minus 7 plus something over x plus 3 plus something over x plus 4 because this is the partial fraction decomposition I'm going to find for this fraction right here. And so that's my next task is what are a and b that will make 38x plus 77 over x squared plus 7x plus 12 identically equal to a over x plus 3 plus b over x plus 4. Of course, that's the same thing as asking what will make 38x plus 77, which is that numerator, identically equal to a times x plus 4 plus b times x plus 3. And of course, that's just asking when is 38x plus 77 identically equal to ax plus 4a plus bx plus 3b. And if I group the x terms together, that of course will be a plus bx. And then if I group the constant terms together, that's 4a plus 3b. If that's identically equal to that polynomial on the left side of the equation, then I know the constant, or rather the first degree coefficients, should match. 
and the constant coefficients should match. Therefore, I have another system of equations, one that says a plus b is equal to 38, and 4a plus 3b is equal to 77. Um, as usual, either solve by substitution or elimination. Uh, let's do the top equation, let's say, by negative 3, which would give me negative 3a minus 3b um, equals minus 114. That way, when I add the two equations together, I'm going to get a, and on the other side, looks like negative 37. Okay, if that's a, of course, I can go back to that equation to determine b. b would be 38 minus a which in this case would be 38 plus 37, which would be 75. So A is negative 37, B is 75. And so back to our original integral, just recall from the last page, our original integral took the form X minus 7 plus A over X plus 3 plus B over X plus 4. So in this case, we're talking about integral x plus 7 plus a over x plus 3 plus b over x plus 4. OK, so a couple of more log integrations, but this time, because of the long division we did, there's also these two terms here. So, of course, in this case, we're just going to get x squared over 2 and 7x and minus 37 ln x plus 3 and 75 ln absolute value x plus 4. And I just realized that should be a minus right there if you go back and look at the problem. Just change the sign on you. Okay, so we've got two examples under our belt now, and in the second one, we're seeing a general principle that we should write down here, which is for rational functions, with the degree of p of x, which is what we were calling the numerator, greater than or equal to the degree of q of x, which was the denominator, we want to re-express in terms of fractions where the degree of the numerators are less than the degree or degrees of the denominators. And we do this with long division. In other words, we need to do long division first to transform this original rational function into a new expression that contains lesser rational expressions or rational functions in which the degree of the numerator is strictly less than the degree of the denominator. Then we can apply the method of partial fraction expansions to those rational expressions. So the upshot here is make sure that when you're looking at p of x over q of x, your rational function that you're going to integrate make sure that the degree of p of x is less than the degree of q of x. If it's not, if it's not strictly less than, then do long division 
And when you do that long division, you're going to get some quotient plus the remainder over the divisor. And that's the rational expression that will guarantee you you have something where the numerator has a smaller degree than the denominator. And then you can successfully apply partial fraction expansion. Okay, let's go back to our first example for a minute, which was the 3 over x squared minus x minus 20, which of course we said could be written as 3 over x minus 5, x plus 4. And we already figured out the a and the b for this one. Uh, but let's, let's pretend we haven't done this yet, and we were trying to figure out the a and the b. And so this is a bit of a, a shortcut method that we're going to talk about here for a minute. This is called the cover-up method. For determining the unknown coefficients a and b. And here's how the cover-up method works. So let's first see where it comes from which is pretty simple. Let's take this equation and let's say we multiplied both sides of it by x minus 5. So of course if we took x minus 5 times 3 over x minus 5 x plus 4 equals x minus 5 times a over x minus 5 plus b over x plus 4 Then, of course, even though none of these functions are actually defined when x equals 5, we know that, for example, the limit of this expression on this side as x approaches 5, let me write that right here. So that would be 3 times x minus 5 over x minus 5 times x plus 4. We know that that limit, of course, would be 3 over 5 plus 4, which would be 3 ninths. And that's, of course, because as long as we're approaching 5, the x minus 5 over x minus 5, those two factors cancel out. All right, so we know that if we were to graph this thing right here, there would be a hole in the graph when x is 5. And the same thing would happen when we put those two together. All right, now, let's think about what happens now if we let x equals 5 in the limit sense. If these go away, then of course what we have here is 3 over x plus 4. If the same thing happens here, we're going to have an a. And then when I put these two together, I'm going to have b times x minus 5 over x plus 4. Now you will notice that this is what I would get if I was taking the limit of both sides as x approaches 5. And of course I would need to plug in 5 to complete the limit taking. And if I did, then of course this would become a 5. And every other place that I see an x would also become a 5. Now of course that means this guy disappears. And that leaves me just these two, which is a equals 3 ninths, which is a equals 1 third, which is what we got when we solved our system originally. All right, so just to recap there, let me write this down again. And you'll start to see the cover-up that they mean. If you notice what happened here when you took this limit that I'm talking about, that is, when I multiplied both sides by x minus 5 and took the limit as x approaches 5, it looks like any term that already had an x minus 5 in the bottom, really what I was doing was covering it up. Because once I multiplied by x plus 5, essentially I removed that x minus 5 because those two were canceling out. Okay, so the cover-up they're talking about is I'm covering up the x minus 5. And I'm also covering up the x minus 5 in the other place. Okay, now, what happened to this one at the end, 
the one that did not have an x minus 5 in the denominator. Well, when you multiplied it by x minus 5 and then let x approach 5, it went to 0. Okay, therefore, any terms that did not have denominators of x minus 5 disappeared to 0. What about the terms that did have x minus 5s in the denominator? They got covered up, as in you could actually just cover up that x minus 5 with your thumb. And if you take what's left over and evaluate at x equals 5, you get the value of a. And by the way, this was supposed to be x plus 4 in this denominator. And that's where we got the 3 ninths, which is 1 third. Okay, notice we could also do this to find the b. So let's see if you can see it here in finding the b. There's 3 over x minus 5 times x plus 4. If that's equal to a over x minus 5 plus b over x plus 4, let's cover up, either with your thumb or mentally, all of the x plus 4s. Okay, what happens to any fractions that do not have an x plus 4 in the denominator? They disappear. Okay, the x plus 4s that are covered up, those should disappear, in which case this just becomes a b. And if this x plus 4 over on the left has also disappeared, the only other thing you need to do is evaluate that x at negative 4. That is the value of x that makes this x plus 4 a 0. Well, if you do that, you get 3 over negative 4 minus 5. You get b equals negative 3 ninths, which is negative 1 third. So the cover-up method is a quick way, and when you practice it a little bit, it is very quick, to help you figure out these coefficients, a and b, when they are derived from linear factors in your denominator. And basically what we're doing is letting x equal 5 to figure out a, and we're letting x equal negative 4 to figure out b. And we'll use this trick a couple more times, so you'll see it in action in the rest of these examples. Okay, now we want to look at what happens If a factor, a linear factor, let's add that, in a denominator is repeated. So for example, I'm thinking of something like x cubed minus 1 over x squared times x minus 2 cubed. Uh, notice that we're good with the degree. The degree of the top is 3. The degree of the bottom is 5. So the degree of the top is smaller than the degree of the bottom, which means uh, if we can figure out how to do this, we should be able to come up with a partial fraction decomposition directly from how this is written already. Now, if you think in reverse about what sorts of fractions you might have originally added together to come up with a denominator, that contain those linear factors, well, thinking about what you know about common denominators of rational expressions, you should definitely come up with the idea that there could have been a fraction with a denominator of x squared, but there also could have been a fraction with a denominator of x. We know that the least common multiple or common denominator for those two is indeed x squared. And so what I'm suggesting here is if your denominator contains an x squared, you're going to have to have two individual partial fractions, one for that power of x and one for every other power of x down to 1, because those are all possible denominators of which the least common multiple is that largest power of 2. So what I mean by that is if you had something over, let's say, x to the fifth, what are all the different fractions whose denominators have a least common multiple of x to the fifth? Well, something over x to the fifth would work, of course, but so would something over x to the fourth, over x cubed, over x squared, 
over x to the first because the common denominator for all five of these is just the largest one, that is the one with the largest power. So I'll write this up in a minute, but what we're suggesting here again is if the power on this repeated factor of x is 2, I'm going to have to have a partial fraction with a denominator of x squared and one with x to the first. I'm also, for the x minus 2 cubed, going to have to have something with a denominator of x minus 2 cubed, but also possibly one with a denominator of x minus 2 squared, and possibly another one with a denominator of x minus 2 to the first. So one partial fraction for every possible power of this linear factor from its multiplicity down to 1 meaning if this power is 3 I should have three partial fractions one for the power of 3 one for the power of 2 one for the power of 1 alright now putting that all together the other question would be what should those numerators look like well following the same logic that we had in our previous examples given that the degree of this is smaller than the degree of the denominator it will suffice to have constant numerators let's say constant unknown numerators provided each of these denominators is built strictly out of linear factors or powers of linear factors which of course they all are so our general method mimics what we did before which is I will have constant numerators for each of these partial fractions the only new twist is that since these linear factors are repeated I just need one partial fraction for every possible power of that linear factor from its multiplicity down to 1. So in this case it means I'm going to write x cubed minus 1 over x squared times x minus 2 cubed as a fraction that's identically equal to a over x squared plus b over x plus c over x minus 2 cubed plus d over x minus 2 squared plus e over x minus 2. Let's try our cover-up method to see if we can't quickly recover one of these constants or maybe two. Okay, so again, how does the cover-up work? Well, I look at what the zeros of this denominator are and I can see the zeros are 0 and 2. If I think about what gets me the 0 of 0, it's this x squared factor. Now there is a little twist here since we're repeating these zeros. What would I have to multiply both sides of this equation by to clear that x squared? I'd have to multiply by x squared. If I multiplied all five of these by x squared and then took the limit as x approaches 0, you should see again that any of these fractions whose denominators did not contain x will go to 0. This goes to 0, this goes to 0, this goes to 0. Now what we said in our previous example was the terms that had x in the denominator, or x squared in this case, would not go to 0. And clearly in this one, this first one, when I take the limit as x goes to 0, I just get a. But notice this one that doesn't have an x squared in the denominator but has less than that. If you have bx squared over x and you take the limit as x goes to 0, that's the limit as x goes to 0 of bx, which is 0. In other words, what's the only one that's left over after you do your cover-up method? It's only the one that contains this largest power of x, which was this first one. All of the other four disappear. Okay, that gets me the a. Now, what happens on the left side? Well, if you're covering up the x squared, that means the part that's left over, which is the x cubed minus 1 over x minus 2 cubed, that has to be evaluated at x equals 0. which of course would give me a equals negative 1 over negative 2 cubed 
that gets me a equals one eighth. Okay, now, without writing everything again, what's the other one that I could get quickly by doing cover up? I could multiply both sides of this equation by x minus 2 cubed because that would cover up the x minus 2 cubed in that denominator. Okay, again, what is the only fraction from this right side then that would be left over after the cover up method? The only one that's left is the one that has that x minus 2 cubed in the denominator, which is that one. In other words, I will end up with c on the right side. What's left on the left side? Well, if the x minus 2 cubed is covered up, what's left is the x cubed minus 1 over x. But notice you're going to evaluate it at x equals 2. That'd be 2 cubed minus 1 over 2 squared because there was an x squared here. Uh, what does that give you? c equals 7 fourths. Okay, now I have the a and I have the c. So that means I've determined this one and this one. I'm still going to have to go back and figure out the other three. Okay, let's go on to the next page and give ourselves a little more room. I've copied our equivalent expressions up here. And of course we know what comes next. To get those other three coefficients, I'm going to have to combine all of this into one fraction so that I can equate this numerator to the common numerator on the right. So let's get to it. There's really no shortcut for this. I know x cubed minus 1 is going to be equivalent to a times Okay, what's missing in this first fraction? Well, the denominator only has the x squared, which means the x minus 2 cubed is what's missing. What would I have to multiply this b over x by? Well, it's missing the x minus 2 cubed, but it's also missing a factor of x. So I'd have bx times x minus 2 cubed. What's missing in that third one is the x squared. And that's all. What's missing in the d over x minus 2 squared? Well, I'm missing the x squared, and I'm also missing a factor of x minus 2. In the last one, I'm missing the x squared, and I'm missing two factors of x minus 2. Which means when I start expanding on the right, and check my algebra here, um, this first one, when I expand that, maybe using Pascal's triangle, it will give me x cubed um, minus 6x squared plus 12x minus 8. This second one is going to be the same thing, but with a bx in front of it. So that would be bx times x cubed minus 6x squared plus 12x minus 8 plus cx squared. And now we're down to the dx squared times x minus 2 part, which would be dx cubed minus 2dx squared plus, now we're down to the ex squared times x minus 2 squared part, which would be ex squared times x squared minus 4x plus 4. Okay, that means x cubed minus 1 should be identically equal to, let's see, we have ax cubed, we have minus 6ax squared, we have plus 12ax, we have minus 8a, that takes care of this part. The next part is bx to the fourth. Now, I didn't have one of those yet. Let's put that over here. And then, of course, the next part is bx times minus 6x squared. So minus 6bx cubed. And then plus 12bx squared. And then minus 8bx. then plus cx squared, 
then plus dx cubed, then minus 2dx squared, then looks like we're down to the ex squared, and when I multiply that or start distributing, the first thing I get is ex to the fourth, and minus 4ex cubed, and looks like 4ex squared. All right, now let's do our matching of coefficients. What is the coefficient on the left side of this identity for the x cubed? Well, it's 1. And let's just write it out to the side here. On the left side of this equation, the third degree coefficient is 1. Notice I do have some fourth degree terms on the right side, and the fourth degree coefficient on the left side of the equation is 0. What's the second degree? It's also 0. What's the first degree? Also 0. But then, since the constant term is minus 1, the constant coefficient is minus 1. Okay, bear that in mind when you start combining terms on the left side. What are the fourth degree terms on the right side of the equation? It's these two. That means when I combine them, I get the equation b plus e equals 0. Now, to organize things, since you do have a lot of constants here, you can organize this the way you like, but you might want to do it this way. Since I know there are going to be a's and b's and c's and d's and e's, you might want to do what I'm trying to do above here and make columns. So that means when I group the b and the e from the x to the fourth terms together, I get that b plus e is 0. And so again, what I'm writing right there is just a little series of columns to help me organize my variables. Okay, what about the third degree terms? Well, let's see, I see all of these are the third degree terms. And when I combine them, the sum of the coefficients of those terms should be equal to the third degree coefficient on the left side of the equation, which is 1. Okay, meaning when I take a minus 6b plus d minus 4e, I should get 1. x squared, well, of course, all of these are the x squared terms. And when I add up the coefficients on those, it should equal or be equivalent to the quadratic coefficient on the left side of the equation, which is 0. So putting all that together, it looks like I get minus 6a plus 12b plus c minus 2d plus 4e, and that should all be equal to 0. Same thing for the x terms. And of course, what's the coefficient on the x term on the left side of the equation? It's 0. So grouping everything there, I would have 12a minus 8b, and that should be equal to 0. OK, what's the only thing that's left? I've saved the simple one. There's only one constant term on the right side of the equation, and that should be equal to the constant term on the left side of the equation, which is minus 1. That means minus 8a has to be equal to minus 1. Okay, what does that last equation get you? It gets you a equals 1 8th. We already knew that. That's the one we figured out with our cover up in the beginning. Now, this is a linear system. Some of these systems are more difficult, and you'll see a few in your homework that are a little more tangled than this. This one looks pretty bad, but actually it's not. If you look at what you have in the equations, I can see that this first equation involves b and e. 
this equation involves B and A. And if I think about what I know again, and let's write those down here, I know A is 1 8 don't know B yet, but I do know C is 7 fourths. We figured that out before with cover-up. Don't know D, don't know E. Okay, what I want to look for first are any really simple equations that exploit the facts that I know A and C. And of course the one that my eye draws to immediately is that fourth equation right there, which says if I know A I can get B immediately. Okay, so that one says uh, 12a minus 8b equals 0. And I know that a is 1 8 so that means 12 times 1 8 equals 8b. 12 times 1 8 is 3 halves. That means b is 3 16 Okay, if we're good on that, I'll erase what I did there to figure out B. And now just work your way back. If you know A, B, and C, what can you get from that? Well, again, what's the other equation that just involves two parameters? It's that first one. It involves B and E, and you have B. Actually, that first equation says that B is equal to, or let's put it this way, E is equal to negative B. And since B is 3 16 that tells you that E is equal to negative 3 16 Okay, what does that leave? We don't know D. Okay, but we've got all the other ones, and we've got two different equations that contain D. If we look at either one of them, well, let's see this one. Finding D just requires that I know A, B, and E. And I've got all three of those. Uh, same thing for the next equation. That one says that I can get E, or rather D, if I know A, B, C, and E. And I know all of those. I like the second one because it just requires that I know or plug in three other things. So that third equation, or rather, uh, I guess we're calling that the second equation, says that D is equal to 1 plus 4e plus 6b minus a. If I just get d by itself on the left side of the equation, that means d is 1 plus 4 times e plus 6 times b minus a. So I guess we've got 1 minus 12 sixteenths plus 18 sixteenths uh, minus a which for some reason I didn't plug in, but that's 1 8th, and that's minus 2 16th, so that's 16 16th, minus 12 16th, plus 18 16th, minus 2, that's what, 4 16th, 2 is at 20 16th, which is 5 fourths, and that's my D. Alright, so it seems like it's long-winded because I'm talking you through all of this, but as you peruse what we've just done here on this page, you see it's just a bunch of polynomial algebra and solving, in the end, a linear system with five unknown coefficients. All right, now, remember, we're not done here. We still have to actually do the problem, uh, which is how do I integrate x cubed minus 1 over x squared times x minus 2 cubed. And of course what we've managed to do is rewrite that rational function in its partial fraction decomposition. And check my numbers here. Um, what I had again was 1 8 for the a and 3 16 for the b and 7 fourths for the C, which was the numerator in the x minus 2 cubed fraction. And then I had minus 3 16 for the x minus 2 squared fraction. And then the E, actually I think those are backwards, aren't they? 
Yeah, E is the minus 3 sixteenths, D is the 5 fourths. Didn't think that looked right. So minus 3 sixteenths, X minus 2. And of course, we're integrating all of that. Well, you should recognize that four of those integrations are power rule integrations, and one's a log integration. So of course, this first one, that's really 1 8 x to the minus 2. So when I integrate that first one, I'm going to get 1 8 times x to the minus 1 over negative 1. This one, the second one, that's the log integration. That's going to be plus 3 sixteenths ln absolute value of x. What's that third one? That's really 7 fourths x minus 2 to the minus 3. If I do a u substitution, u equals x minus 2, du is dx. So of course what I'll get there is 7 fourths times x minus 2 to the add 1 to my exponent. And that gets me negative 2. And of course I'll divide by negative 2. The fourth one should be 5 fourths. Well again, same story. This one is 5 fourths x minus 2 to the negative 2. So when I add 1 to that, it's going to be negative 5 fourths x minus 2 to the negative 1. And actually, I, I misspoke before. There is another log one that comes from that uh, standalone term at the end with the x minus 2 in it. That's going to be minus 3 sixteenths ln absolute value of x minus 2. And then, of course, that can be cleaned up a little bit. All right, so just to recap here, we've got our methods for integrating rational functions that can be decomposed into partial fractions, where our original denominator is made up out of linear factors and or linear factors that are repeated. Okay, I'm going to stop at the end of this example and I'm going to make a second video for the second part of the section uh, only because I don't want a big huge long video for all of this so I am going to break it up into two. The second video will be shorter and I'll post that later. Let me know if you have questions.